Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, Jerusalem sent condolences, humanitarian aid, and a delegation of home front command search and rescue teams to Turkey after a series of devastating earthquakes rocked the country, killing several thousand people and leaving thousands more injured. Just after the news of the quake, Israel's Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, mobilized an IDF team to provide assistance. He said our security forces are prepared to provide any aid that will be required. And he noted that the defense establishment is experienced in responding to emergency scenarios and saving lives. Israel has set up a field hospital on the ground in Turkey, equipped with the most advanced equipment brought in from the Jewish state, with an additional 250 medical doctors, nurses, military medics, and rescue experts. Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen, has also instructed his ministry to put together a rapid aid package to help Turkey deal with this terrible tragedy. Israel has also sent blankets, tents, and medical supplies to its enemy, Syria, and offered to receive its injured citizens for treatment in the Jewish state. Israel and Sudan have finalized the text of their landmark peace agreement, which will see the full normalization of ties between the two nations. Israel's Foreign Minister Eli Cohen announced this extraordinary development, saying that his recent visit to Sudan laid the foundation for the historic accord with this strategic Arab and Muslim country. Cohen added that the peace agreement between Jerusalem and Khartoum will promote regional stability and contribute to the national security of the state of Israel. The Republic of Chad has officially opened its embassy in the Jewish state. The president of Chad, Mahmoud Idris Debi Into, prayed at the Western Wall in the old city of Jerusalem before inaugurating his country's diplomatic mission in Israel. He thanked God for bringing the two nations to this moment in peace, and he thanked his late father for the courage and vision to reestablish relations with Israel in 2019. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu hailed the historic development, which followed years of work, including a formal visit by Netanyahu to Chad in his previous term. During the visit, he and the former president, Debbie's late father, laid the groundwork for a diplomatic relationship between the African nation and the Jewish state. Netanyahu said, we are strengthening our common interests and friendship and pursuing peace, security, and prosperity. Israel's finance minister, Betzalel Smutrich, has signed an order to double the financial penalty for the Palestinian Authority's continued participation in its pay to slay program. The PA gives monthly stipends to the families of terrorists, which encourages Arabs to commit violence against Jews. Smutrich announced that he is also withholding 100 million shekels in tax fees, saying the PA finances terrorists, and the state of Israel is saying enough. The Israeli cabinet is also considering legislation which would revoke the citizenship and residency of anyone who participates in terror by accepting blood money from the Palestinian Authority. The United States House of Representatives has voted to remove Ilan Omar from its Foreign Affairs Committee. Omar has made several anti-Semitic comments and has used her position to spread anti-Israel bias. Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, said that Omar's comments make it clear that she is unfit to represent the U.S. on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He cited her use of anti-Semitic tropes and her comparison of Israel to Hamas and the Taliban as examples of her extreme anti-Israel bias. The Republican Jewish coalition praised the move, saying that for years, Democratic leadership has failed to hold Representative Elon Omar accountable for her vile, hateful and dangerous anti-Israel and anti-Semitic rhetoric. Israel's Minister of Heritage, Amichai Eliyahu, has ordered a probe into the legality of the U.S. government's decision to repatriate an artifact looted in Israel to the Palestinian Authority. In early January, American officials made the controversial decision to give a 2,700-year-old ivory spoon to the PA. This is the first time that a recovered artifact found in the Jewish state has been given to the Palestinian Authority. The PA has a long history of looting and intentionally destroying Jewish and Christian archaeological sites in an attempt to rewrite the history of the land of Israel. Eliyahu accused the PA of committing national terrorism and attempting to erase Jewish heritage in the biblical heartland. 
He announced that he will give the Israel Antiquities Authority full control over archaeological excavations in Judea and Samaria to ensure that all heritage sites will earn full protection at an international and scientific standard. Egypt is planning a pipeline to export Israeli gas to Saudi Arabia. Globe's Financial Journal has reported that Cairo will construct a conduit that will cross the Gulf of Eilat to Saudi Arabia, allowing Egypt to provide Riyadh with natural gas, some of which will be supplied by Israel. Globe's noted that this is yet another sign of warming ties between the Jewish and Gulf states. Turkey has announced the arrest of 15 people with links to the Islamic State terror group. The individuals were reportedly planning attacks on synagogues and churches. The country has become a hotbed of terror activity, with radical Islamic groups using it as a staging ground for attacks. Several Western nations shuttered their consulates in Istanbul after receiving intelligence about security threats, prompting a major Turkish police operation to arrest the members of the Islamic State cell. Israel has intervened and provided Istanbul with intelligence, which helped to thwart several plots, and the Mossad has even scooped up targeted Israelis and whisked them out of Turkey to safety. The population of Judea and Samaria has surpassed half a million Jewish residents. The recent figures, derived from data released by the Israeli Interior Ministry's Population Registry, shows a 15.5% increase from January of 2018. More Jews are settling in the biblical heartland, and projections show that this trend will only continue. Israel is expecting the Jewish population in the area to increase to 600,000 by 2030. The community is set to grow to 700,000 in 2035, and by 2047, there will be more than a million Jews living in Judea and Samaria. A Torah scroll that was hidden from the Nazis has been recovered and gifted to Yad Vashem, Israel's National Holocaust Memorial Museum. Mordechai Kanner fled his native Poland when Germany invaded the country during World War II. His journey led him through a village where he encountered an elderly Jewish woman who asked him to take a Hebrew scroll of the five books of Moses for safekeeping from the Nazis, who would have surely destroyed it. Although he tried, Kanna was unable to carry the precious Torah, so he buried it and vowed to return. After the war, he went back to the small town and retrieved the holy parchment. Kanner emigrated to Israel with his family and the treasured Torah scroll in 1949. Now his daughter, Sarah Megiddish, and his grandson, Avi Kanner, have decided to donate the Torah scroll to Yad Vashem. Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics has recorded a sharp rise in tourism this year. More than 250,000 pilgrims came to the Holy Land this January alone. Last year, CBS reported that 2.7 million visitors came to the Jewish state. And this year, the Ministry of Tourism is optimistic that the number of tourists coming to Israel will be even higher. The Jewish state won big at the recent Grand Slam judo tournament in Paris. 23-year-old Israeli judoka Gili Sharir clinched the gold medal in the under-63 kilogram match at the competition, and Geffen Primo won the bronze in the under-52 kilo category. Shani Hershko, the coach of the Israeli women's judo team, praised the female athletes, saying that she is very proud of the Israeli team and the athletes for their commitment and hard work. Jews around the world marked the celebration of Tu Shvat last week. This holiday is observed on the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Shvat and celebrates the new year for trees. The Bible commands Jews to eat fruit from trees only three years after they are planted. Therefore, rabbis created a date to calculate the beginning of the agricultural cycle. This also applies to biblical tithes, including the offering of first fruits, or the Bikurim, and the compulsory produce donation to the Levites, the widows, and the poor. Tubi Shvat has become known as the Israeli Arbor Day, as it is marked by planting trees. Many Jews observe the custom of holding a Tubi Shvat Seder, or festive meal, that includes the blessings on the fruits of the land of Israel. This holiday is meant to honor God's creation and appreciation for the environment around us. Residents of Israel celebrated the rare phenomenon of snow this past week. A winter storm dumped several inches of much-needed rain throughout the country, and some areas even received snow. 
Mount Hermon, Israel's only ski resort, reported heavy snowfall and even had to close due to the bad weather conditions. The communities of Gush Etzion in the Judean mountains also received snow to the envy of the residents of Jerusalem. Jews continue to pray for the precipitation in the Holy Land, and Israelis view this winter storm as a true blessing from God. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Dr. Pauline Plummer. She is the founder of Covenant Daughters International Ministry. Pauline, thank you for being on the show. Wow, thank you, Josh, so much for having me. It's so good to be here. Thank you. Please tell us a little bit about what is Covenant Daughters International Ministry? Covenant Daughters uh, International Ministries is a ministry that I've started in 1999 uh, for women. It's a mentorship uh, program for women. Uh, we help them to find their leadership uh, abilities as well as their help them to tap into their untapped potential and to help them to, um, in every sector of society, present their best self to the world. You also have a TV ministry that uh, broadcasts from Israel. Tell us a little about that. Yes, it's Covenant Daughters Television Network, and it is a network created for women, by women. It's the first of its kind, and it's 24-7 uh, uh, women programming. Um, we, we cover every gamut, every sector of life, and just to kind of, I believe that if a woman can see it, she can believe that she can be it. And so we want to provide that mentorship through media for women to help them to be the best wives, mothers, uh, business women, CEOs, whatever role that they play, we are here to help them with that. You're also known as the First Lady of Israel. You uh, came here with your husband, Glenn Plummer, uh, who's a very uh, uh, influential pastor, to work on bringing black America and Israel together. Why is that important? You know, it's very important. Number one, uh, we've been here in Israel for uh, going on two and a half years, and we felt it was very important for us to be here after he was appointed by our church as the representative and bishop for, of Israel to uh, be here because a lot of times the narratives of Israel are so misconstrued. And sometimes it's, it's hard for people to understand what they haven't been exposed to. And as long as we can remember, black America in America has been allies with the Jewish people. And so being here in Israel, we felt that it was very important to come and build a bridge uh, so that black America could come and to visit. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King uh, gave his last speech at our church in Memphis before he died, before, before he was assassinated. And he spoke of being in the promised land. And, he, and in one of his messages, he talked about how uh, it being in Israel, seeing uh, Israel and the importance of Israel's existence, uh, how it impacted his life. And so he was planning on bringing so many people here, like 5,000. And so when we received the assignment, we wanted to make sure that the narrative of Israel is correct and that people could really see not what they see in news media, what, what they hear, but that they could really understand the true story of Israel, which is God's story. It was very significant last year. Your church, which is the largest black uh, church in America. Yes. Um, um, its presiding bishop made an historic visit here. Tell us about that. Yes, he did. It was the first time uh, that a large uh, group of black Americas Americans have, had come to Israel, and our bishop, Bishop John Drew Sheard, led that um, that uh, that that tour here, the pilgrimage here, and I, you know, and I get so excited because Ben Gorion um, actually wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King about, you know, his planning to bring, uh, you know, uh, thousands of Black Americans here, and he said that it would be the American, the first. American Negro community pilgrimage to Israel. And so, um, and here we are, what, uh, 50 years later, 
and uh, Bishop Sheard led that uh, led that led over 200 people here to the Promised Land, and it was amazing. You also bring uh, youth here. Uh, one of the missions of the church is to bring the next generation. Why is it so important that the next generation of Black America learn about Israel and get involved with Israel? Yes. Well, for the last. I would say five years uh, or six or more, we've been bringing young people here. Um, and that is important because one of the things that we realize is that the story of Israel must be told and not from an antiquated place or not from a historical place, but a contemporary place because uh, Israel is, is still in existence, you know, uh, and, and, and modern Israel is, is moving forward in God's covenant is still with Israel. So to have young generation of uh, young people come and be able to experience Israel, they can see not only um, the hand of God, the faithfulness of God, and his covenant with, with, with Israel, but his covenant with humanity. Pauline, there are literally tens of millions of people watching the show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would say to the viewing audience is that as the people of God, we have a responsibility uh, to the Jewish people, and we have an obligation to God to continue to stand in solidarity and full support of the Jewish state and the Jewish people. And I know that we are living in, in, in turbulent times, but we must understand that Israel is the center of, of it all. And so we must um, Make sure that as believers, come and visit, come and see what God is still doing. Uh, we've heard the stories of over 2,000 years, but God is still moving today. And I would encourage you to, number one, stand in solidarity and support of Israel. Because when you stand in solidarity and support with Israel, you stand in support of what God's is and his agenda and what he's doing. Thank you, Pauline, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the Return to Zion with Karen Hayesod. I'm Sam Grunwerg, World Chairman of Karen Hayesod, the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Aryeh Oz is one of Israel's most famed pilots and was responsible for helping to bring home our brothers and sisters from Ethiopia. Let his story inspire you to help bring home the next generation of Ethiopian Olim. I was born in Germany. My uh, family fled Germany after the Kristallnacht to Holland with an intention to immigrate to Palestine. However, the Germans conquered Poland and we were stuck in Holland. It was 1942 when we were summoned to the German headquarters and told that we have to evacuate our home to an extermination camp in uh, Poland. A student came over and said, we have a hiding place for you. The next day I found myself in a Dutch farming family. They kept me for three years. I immigrated into Israel in 1946. I was almost 11 years old. I was completely alone in this world. Wherever I came, somebody or some institute came to my rescue. The biggest of all was a youth village where I came to. The educational management took me by the hand and guided me and gave me a start which made my way up to flying school a piece of cake. I was selected by the Air Force to become a cadet in the most, well, famous Israeli Air Force. 
I was grateful that I could repay in a small way and contribute to the same effort. This mutual responsibility from which I gained so much followed through my whole career in the Air Force. I was the third captain who flew a C-130 Hercules to Entebbe and rescued so and so many people. When we were told that we have to fly four airplanes to Entebbe at weights beyond any imagination, we didn't ask any question. We said, it is needed, it will be done. In the early 90s, we were about to evacuate 14,500 Ethiopian Jews from Addis Ababa to Tel Aviv. We had 760 seats in our aircraft. However, when they arrived and all the seats were occupied, commanding officer of the operation came over and said, we need you to take more people on. And my answer was, you, you don't have to ask even. It's obvious, bring them on. I set the world record. I brought on one flight 1,087 people uh, from Addis Ababa to uh, Ben Gurion Airport. When we descended and came over Jerusalem and made a left turn towards Ben Gurion, and the whole oil aircraft was singing Yerushalayim of gold, there was not one person in the cockpit who had no tears in his eyes. Every time that when I made my walk around, I always looked up and saw the Star of David and said to myself, gee, this is Israel. This is the Jewish people. Let's bless Israel together. Now's the time for you to get involved. Assist Karen Hayasod to raise the necessary funds in order to bring Jews yearning for their homeland back to Israel. Your donation can help fulfill the biblical prophecy today. To donate and get information, visit our website at www.khisrael.org. And now, Shining Light from Israel. The Dead Sea, located just 25 miles from our holy capital of Jerusalem, is the lowest place in the entire world, 1,500 feet below sea level. Just off the main highway towards the Dead Sea is an old British road connecting Jericho and Jerusalem. It leads to Wadi Kelt, a dried out riverbed known here as Nachal Prat. Just behind me, you can see a beautiful complex hanging on the cliffs of Wadi Kelt. And this is a remnant of a thriving monastic community that lived here in the Judean desert during the Byzantine Empire 1,500 years ago. And it's believed by Christians that it was built on top of the cave in which Elijah the prophet hid from the wicked queen of the north, Jezebel. And we can read about this story in the book of Kings in the Bible. While heading back to the main highway from St. George's Monastery, make sure to stop in the Jewish village of Mitzpah Yericho to enjoy an overlook to the modern city of Jericho, where archeologists have discovered the biblical site where Joshua and the Israelites conquered the city of Jericho over 3,000 years ago. And if you're feeling adventurous, residents here in this small Jewish community offer Jeep rides throughout the Judean desert, including the monastery, and of course, overlooks here to Jericho. 
come with me as we head down towards the Dead Sea. Right now, we're at sea level, which means we've descended 3,000 feet. Let's go visit the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, literally the lowest place on Earth you can walk on dry land, 1,500 feet below sea level. And what caused this massive valley here? The Syrian African Rift, the largest fault line in the entire world, spanning 6,000 kilometers. It goes from Africa all the way up into Turkey. It's what formed the Red Sea, which comes out of the Indian Ocean. That's the port of Aqaba and the city of Eilat, the most southern city here in Israel. The Arava Valley, the Sea of Galilee, the Hula Valley, all part of this large system called the Syrian African Rift. The Dead Sea is one of Israel's most popular tourist sites. And the reason being is that the water here is so hypersalinated, 33% salt minerals that you can't sink. You literally float on water. It's like being completely weightless. But also the health benefits of floating in the water are world renowned. Some people even go to the shores of the Dead Sea in order to gather its mud, rub it all over them to experience and enjoy its healing properties. Here at the Dead Sea, the biblical narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah take place. After the split of Abraham and Lot, where Lot comes here, and due to the misbehavior of the people who are living here, Sodom is destroyed with fire and brimstone, and what is left behind but pillars of salt. There are many activities that visitors to the Dead Sea can experience. From visiting the national parks of Masada, Qumran, or hiking through the majestic trails of En Gedi. One can take an ATV tour through the Judean hills here in the desert. Or a really special activity is to do a boat tour or kayak tour along the shores of the Dead Sea to places that are inaccessible by any other way. Once there, you can mine salt crystals from the ground. For those of you who are looking to spend more than a day here in the region of the Dead Sea, in Ain Bokek, there are literally over a dozen hotels, from five-star resorts to more budget-friendly accommodations. Thanks again for watching. And on your next visit to Israel, make sure to visit the region of the Dead Sea. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates. Oh,